Oh man, what am I going to do with this one, man? It's so deep, oh, so many insights, so much to talk about. Oh Jesus, how can I do this book justice, really? Really need an interview with the author this time. Make things way easier if I could just ask the questions, let him speak. But jeez, no reply. Damn, what am I going to do? Quit! Sensei Lawrence, stop your whining. Whining's for pussies. I didn't teach you to be a pussy. I taught you to be a badass. So what if you can't get an interview with the author? You don't need it. You're the teacher. You pick the ideas in the book you think are worth talking about, and you make a video and teach others. You can do it. Think about the writing you did on near-death experiences. And the book you wrote, diving deep into the question of the ultimate reality. So what if it has a shitty sales rank? You fail and you get back up and try again. So stop bitching and waiting around and get it done. Do you understand? Yes, Sensei! Oh, I love Cobra Kai. That, it, that show really got me hooked. If you haven't seen it yet, get on Netflix and watch it. Cobra Kai is one of the best shows I've seen in a long time. Not, not that I've seen a lot of shows. I'm more of a video game guy. But uh, it is a really, really great show about karate. But anyway, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Jeffrey Crypaul. He is the Newton Razor Chair. Hmm. Doesn't really sound like a chair I'd want to sit on. Razor chair? Uh, no thing. Anyway, it's you know, it's not it's not razor. It's spelled a little bit differently. And well, it's not actually a chair. I mean, it's it's a position. I I should stop talking. Anyway, Jeffrey Kripal, the Newton Razor Chair in Philosophy and Religious Thought at Rice University in Houston. And he's written a number of books, uh, my favorites being Authors of the Impossible and the one we're going to talk about today, which is Mutants and Mystics right here. I got the, got the hard copy I bought a long time ago because it came out, um, you know, a few years back. So it's not exactly a new book. But there's just such a wealth of material in it. And if you're interested in, in the paranormal, the occult, and how that ties into uh, fictional writing, real-life paranormal experiences, and tying that into uh, comic books and sci-fi books, you definitely want to pick up this book. Uh, so we are talking about the badass author, Jeffrey Kripal. That's right. And where should we begin? Yes, so it's about the overlap between fact and fiction. And that's what you're going to get if you read this book. It is a mind bender. And I love it because of the, like I said, the number of insights and the interesting stories he tells about the authors of comic books, of sci-fi novels, and um, their real life experiences. It will keep you captivated. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Real life alien encounters or popular culture works of fiction depicting aliens? Well, we've got Spider Man's iconic almond eyes first appear, according to Cry Paul, in 1962 in Amazing Fantasy number 15. Did that influence later abduction accounts? Did the fiction come first and then that was incorporated into? real life experiences if you want to call them actual experiences i mean there's a big debate maybe uh maybe it's just imagination but anyway it brings up a question and then there's superman who was originally introduced as the man of tomorrow implying he represented the future evolution of humanity his amazing strength was compared to that of the ant and his ability to leap to that of the grasshopper spider-man an alien from planet Krypton who crashes on Earth and is described in insectoid terms. Hmm. Insect-like aliens? I've heard of this, yes. Aliens are also speculated to be, um, by some, to be us from the future. With their enlarged heads and small bodies, as we grow in mental prowess, it is said, we will have less use for our large muscular bodies. And so the alien represents this future. Spider-Man shows up in comics in 1938. Nine years later, we get Roswell. 
the beginning of the saucer myth and aliens crashing to Earth. So, and then later on, we have abductions, sometimes insectoid-like aliens with superhuman powers um, are said to abduct people. So there you got, you got your crossover there. Oh man, Jeffrey Kripal's book is wild, my friends. Wild in a good way. Making connections between paranormal events and the writings of popular culture. Let's go to the X-Men. Professor Xavier, a radiated mutant who gains telepathic powers. The term telepathy was coined by Frederick Myers in 1882, and he linked it to the spiritual forces of evolution. Professor Xavier, whose parents had worked on the Manhattan Project, was the first radiated mutant. Some special energy enters the body and transforms it? The person then gains superhuman normal powers. Hmm. Ah, I got it. Yes, yes, that sounds familiar too. Uh, from real life, and again, there's a debate of whether these experiences are real or not. But anyway, let's not get into that. But enter Gopi Krishna is just one guy who describes in his book Kundalini, the evolutionary energy in man, how he was meditating one day when he was overwhelmed by an energy stream, which erupted and moved through his spinal column out the top of his head in an experience of cosmic consciousness and light. He argues that this metaphysical energy or force which erupted in and flowed through him is like a living electricity that intends to transform the flesh until we are veritable gods on earth. The cities or superpowers of Hinduism are manifested by this evolutionary energy and the, this energy is connected to the same force that produces sexual desire, according to Gopi. So sex and spirituality are connected. Never forget it. Uh, spiritual and physical evolution are connected. The libido and sexual energies can be transformed into a living spiritual energy that transforms and evolves the person who experiences it in a kundalini-like awakening where the energy flows up through the spine, this sort of metaphysical energy. In the X-Men mythology itself, it is pointed out that a mutant potential first actualizes around puberty, the onset of sexual maturity. Sex and superpowers are somehow connected. So in real life cases of medium, psychics, or poltergeist phenomenon, we often see such powers manifesting around the age of puberty. Hmm. He even connects the presumed uh, sex life of the authors of the comic book creators to the number of superpowers their characters have. So less sex for the author, more superpowers in the comic, in the character. More sex for the author, and you wind up with a character like Batman who, you know, doesn't really have superpowers. He's just badass, right? Just like Cobra Kai. Anyway, you got to watch it. Okay, so in the book, Kripal goes through a number of themes which r run through sci-fi works and the occult and paranormal literature. Uh, pick up the book and read about those themes. I'm not going to go over all those. What I found fascinating was the very paranormal experiences of the authors and how those real-life experiences shaped their fiction writing. Often they based their fiction writing on their actual lived experience of paranormal phenomenon. So we have uh, Superman and Batman writer Alvin Swartz, for example, remembers people he had encountered in his own life who had ordinary superpowers, like a man who could see people's auras and diagnose their health and emotional state. He once witnessed a neighbor who was a painter named by, by the name of Jackson Polak. Uh, he painted, and as Schwartz puts it, the paint did not seem to obey the law of gravity. It poured in impossible directions, as if some other force were directing it. He concluded that the circular forms already on the canvas were doing the influencing, as though in their representations of pure acceleration, they formed tiny gravitational fields of their own. Okay, just ponder that for a second. 
Um, so yeah, we all know people who seem to, what do you call it, get in the zone and display abilities that seem superhuman at the time. When you're in this zone, locked into what you're doing, everything else fades away, and you kind of just do it unconsciously. But it seems like there's some greater force at work inside you. We see that in sports. We see it in painting. So anyway, then came the experience he had with his first wife, Marjorie. Now, this one is wild. Uh, So as his wife was working on a painting of flowers and fruit on a table, she felt blocked and then inspired. She began painting over the fruit and the flowers as if possessed. Swartz recognized the forms that emerged on the canvas as that of the Hindu elephant headed god Ganesha, uh, Shiva, and then Buddha. So Marjorie was painting these Hindu gods and goddesses. Uh, But she was doing it as if possessed. This was not what she wanted to do. Marjorie actually became fearful and angry, exclaiming, that's not how I want to paint. Take it away. She then picked up a pencil and wrote out a command, as if possessed again, that they were both to become vegetarians. This was followed by a command for her to bathe and meditate before the canvas. So she did that last part. She bathed and meditated and then as she, as she meditated, I guess, she spoke of a force that did not belong to her, but she to it. She expressed how she thought something was wrong, as if the creative energies had short-circuited in her. Alvin, uh, remembering his reading of the chakras in tantric yoga, asked her to cross her wrists and hold his hands. When Swartz held her hands... He said he immediately felt a swift surge of exhilarating force rushing up through his arms and through his body. And after that discharge of whatever occult energy was flowing through Marjorie, she relaxed and started breathing easier. And that experience influenced him to write Superman. And the meaning of both was that there had to be some sort of hidden deeper self, some super self, if you may, of which our own Clark Kent personality, you know, our culturally conditioned and time-bound ego self, was but a dim reflection. The human as two. We all have this Superman self, but it can be too much to bear, so we need our regular Kent Clark, regular self, to live comfortably in this world. And then there's Grant Morrison, who based his writing of The Invisibles off of a paranormal experience he had in a Kathmandu hotel room overlooking a Buddhist temple. There, he says he was visited by shiny silver antibodies. Okay, code for aliens. He doesn't want to call them aliens, but these shiny silver antibodies, you can just think aliens. Anyway, in this hotel room, Overlooking the Buddhist temple, apparently he was visited by some antibodies from the fifth dimension, no less. An experience he described as like being electrocuted by God. And during this experience, he had an out-of-body experience of higher dimensions. Communication with fan-like creatures made out of neon tubes, which worked on sound frequencies and light. Okay, it sounds crazy, but in the higher dimension, he was shown time as a single whole, seeing all of history and all our tomorrows as a single object. We just covered time. If you go back and watch my last video, uh, time is an interesting subject, and he was able to see time as a whole object, which makes sense if time's a dimension. You go higher than that dimension, you see it all at once. Um I really like that idea. The time exists in an in an all now. The future is already there. We just haven't experienced it yet because we're locked into these three, four dimensions. Uh, but that's actually quite a common experience. You know, I have written about near-death experiences. Um, it's quite common in near-death experiences too to see past or future events and to be able to see all time especially during like the life review where 
you see all the events in your life at once. And you can replay them, basically. And what I found really fascinating about that in near-death experiences is that not only do you see the event from your perspective, but you can like jump into somebody else's consciousness and experience what they felt during the encounter. So like if you hurt somebody, you can experience from their side what they were thinking, what they were feeling, the pain it caused. Also the joy, doesn't have to be bad. Uh, anyway, we're talking about Crypal's book, not near death, we'll do that in another video. Okay, gotta, gotta hit myself, stop it, stay on topic. I never stay on topic, you know, I'm always, making connections and that's why I love Crypaw because like I said this book is deep and I really wanted to just interview him because there's so much in there and you know he does organize it but it is a lot of experiences in in you know all over the place but in a good way okay so another profound insight Moore had was that he saw humanity as all just this one object like a huge anemone on the planet and it was kind of the idea that we were devouring the environment like a larval caterpillar on a leaf in order to fuel its metamorphosis into something bigger this brings the question to mind will our destruction of the environment ultimately lead to something better well if it does it must involve our evolution or destruction either the crises which are about to come through such destruction force us into a hyper-evolution, maybe spiritually, I'm thinking. We all know we evolve through crises. As we overcome them, we, we uh, grow and get stronger and better. Or humanity gets destroyed by the crises to come and something new and greater can start flourishing on Earth. I'm not sure what he what that experience uh, meant for him, but that's what it brings to mind to me. Okay, so then there's Philip K. Dick, who had a number of seeming paranormal experiences in what uh, many might consider schizophrenic episodes, which he formed his novels around. Uh, Crypaul goes into depth. I'm not really going to talk about uh, Philip K. Dick, but um, he is a famous author, and uh, read the book to find out more about what he had going on. But the most profound uh, experience, I think, was the real-life experience of comic book illustrator Barry Windsor Smith, who experienced at least two precognitive visions that led to some deep shattering or opening of his mind. Uh, so let's get into one of them, the, the, just the deepest, most profound one. As he was working on his illustrations for the comic book Conan in 1970, he says that, quote, I was leaning into the paper at close range when, in an instant, the off-white surface seemed to dissolve before my eyes, leaving only the wooden drawing board on my lap. Then the board itself also began to disappear, and in its place was a scene full color and movie-like of a noisy traffic jam. He saw the scene in great detail as if he were just above it. He saw specific details, including two white trucks that were stalled, causing the jam, and yellow honking taxicabs. In the vision, he could tell he was looking at the scene through a window as he could see his reflection in the glass. Now keep in mind, this was all a vision that played out on the white canvas before him, Eventually, that vision faded and he was back to staring at the white paper on his drawing board. Fast forward, no less than three years later, Smith, back in his studio working, heard a big commotion outside, people yelling, cars honking and the like. It kept going on, so he decided to look out the window and lo and behold, there was the exact scene he had seen in the vision three years earlier. Uh, two white refrigerator trucks stalled in the middle of the intersection and a bunch of pissed off taxi cab drivers. Yeah. This is the kind of reality upending experience that will send shockwaves through your soul, through your body. Uh, maybe shockwaves of fear, right? 
Uh, after all, this is not supposed to happen. This just rocks our sense of reality. Uh, the fragile ego, I'm scared, <laughs> crumbles. And it runs and hides in fear of that kind of reality um, shocking experience, reality shattering. That's what I want to say. And this experience took Barry for a ride. He describes a separate presence which slipped into his central perception of self. He began to see circular formations of stars and planets, and he witnessed the unimaginable distances between the stars. He felt and understood that he was a part of everything, that him and the stars were, quote, profoundly related as if by birth, but separated by some yet-to-be-realized circumstance. The finale to this grand vision was a bright light that soared from out of the nearest lower right void and fired upward. It then arced and came to form an enormous circle, possibly light years in circumference, as its head met its tail. Then four bright pinpoints of white light fired in sequence along its, along its path. In an utterly illuminated state of consciousness, he says, I knew that these four lights represented the physical energy of the two future sight, past sight phenomena that I had experienced yesterday and today. Again, I said he had multiple experiences like this of seeing the future before it happened and then experiencing it in that future and just being shocked to his core. Uh, Kripal aptly interrupts that vision as a modern day uh, Euroboros or cosmic snake biting its own tail in an expression of paradox, eternal unity, and cyclical process. Okay, but that's, it gets way, way deeper. Hold on. That's not even, that's just a small part. He had another experience the next day, no less. He was back in the studio when he suddenly felt extremely tired, as if the force of gravity had multiplied itself a hundredfold. It was as if a force just overtook him, and he fell onto the couch, unable even to lift his eyelids. He fell into, for lack of a better word, a deep sleep. But this was no ordinary sleep. He was gone. Literally, not in this three-dimensional world anymore. He went to a place beyond time. There was no time. There was just the completeness of forever. He sensed that this perfect nothingness was actually a presence which wanted to communicate with him. And he describes it as being in like infinite blackness, a perfect nothingness. But it was a presence. Okay, he realized that he was now pure transcendent consciousness. No more body, no pulsing red meat factory, as Kripal puts it. He was just consciousness. Time didn't exist. No before and after bullshit. There was another kind of dimension, though, which he describes as meaningfulness. And as the meaning grew, another element was added to the stew, black waves of energy each starting from a point unimaginably far from his center of perception and moving towards him expanding exponentially as they approach so it was like this wave that started as a point and got bigger and bigger and bigger as it approached his center his point of perception Okay, he understood that in perceiving this moment, he says, I had perceived light. And as this black light broke upon my shore of perception just in front of me, perhaps a million miles away, I realized that the wave was actually blacker than the ultimate black of the surrounding infinity. Wave after wave came, each blacker than the last. Each wave brought uncountable experiences transmigrating time and multidimensional space, the histories of trillions of otherwise unknowable events since this universe spawned consciousness. Each wave contained all the experiences of the previous waves vested in the depths of the all-knowing that exists everywhere, but is as yet unrecognizable 
by the human race. That's, that's pretty deep, man. I don't think you can have a deeper, more profound experience than that. It's like at the base of reality, there's some presence, there's some, I want to say creator, but some energy that's alive and that has experienced everything since the beginning. Well, there is no time. <laughs> okay, it's too, it's too hard not to think about time. You know, I've been on this earth too long. I don't even know what it's like to not experience time. I've only had like one, I've never had an experience that deep. I've only had like one like opening that, you know, could have been, you know, some out of body, some cosmic consciousness experience, but fear snapped me out of it. <clears throat> so back when I was getting into UFOs and uh, near-death experiences and I was reading a lot and changing my perspectives and learning so much, um, one night I was in a hip hypnagogic state, which is like right in between awake and sleep. Hold on one second. Let's close that window. Don't want any noise to interfere. So I was in the hypnagogic state. And I saw like a Buddhist monk. Looked like a Buddhist monk in my vision. You know, it's kind of like a dream at the time. And he had this like pin or little needle. And he touched like a circle, like a cell maybe. And then waves started coming out of it. And I could feel, you know, I understood that it was in my body. He was touching, which I guess I would um, interpret as my chakras. And anyway, it went up through the chakras. And then as he got higher, kept touching the points on my body and the waves I saw, as it got higher, I heard a just a roaring internal sound of a roaring in my ears and I saw just light. It was like a, like what the sun looks like, I guess, a yellowish, orangish. It was just, my vision was of light. But as the roaring got louder, that's when I kind of snapped out of the hypnagogic state and became aware of what was going on. So my ego self snapped back in and realized what was going on and I got scared and the experience shut down. Now, if that would have continued, would I have had an experience of cosmic consciousness, of being one with everything? I think quite possibly. And so, and so I, I really wish I would have just not had the fear and continued to the resolution, to the end of that experience. Anyway, uh, back to Kripal. So as uh, Kripal puts it, he experienced a cosmic perspective where trillions of bits of experience and linear time was replaced by meaningfulness in an everything all at once. And he couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. Just like I, I couldn't take it. Like I was too scared to wherever I, I was about to go. In my consciousness, I, I was scared and the fear shut down the experience. And um, this experience he had was too much to take, too much to bear. So he just wanted to be back in his apartment with his girlfriend, hopefully, uh, maybe sipping a pina colada, who knows. But he wanted to be back. Hey, hello, Clark Kent, phone home. You know, I want my humanity back. So... Um, Basically, yeah, it's like this Superman shit is freaking me out, man. Like I can't, I can't take this. <laughs> this experience is too, too much. So he panicked. Uh, metaphorically speaking, he went into a rage, ranting and raving, begging for the familiar three dimensions of his humanity. In his own words, he says, I have never before or since experienced such a deeply palpable sense of regret as that which pervaded the presence that had journeyed so determinedly to my door of self. First, it was a momentary confusion about my actions, then an adjustment of sorts, 
Then a profoundly pained retreat and accepted acceptance of my free will to return to my existence as a flesh-bound being. So it's very interesting that it seems like the presence really wanted to share that experience with him. The presence must have initiated it, must have put him into that deep sleep and then was felt pain as, at his insistence of getting the hell out of there. You know, and this is something uh, that needs to be brought up, something I've thought about, and who am I to say? Because I, I'm just thinking in a logical human body, which, you know. But anyway, if there is a God, if there is a sort of God at the base of reality, and it's just one God, wouldn't it be a lonely existence? I mean, we always have two, you know, the man and the woman come together and form a loving relationship or the man and the man or the woman and the, okay, it doesn't matter. But it's like, if you were the only thing that existed, that would be lonely. So maybe that's the purpose of all this. That's the meaning of this reality is so that we can be split up into opposites and come together and find each other in love. But anyway, that's literally the deepest experience um, I've ever read about. And I've read about a lot of them. Um, and there's a lot of speculation in this book about the future of the body. Are we to evolve into beings with higher forms of consciousness? Is that where evolution is taking us? Unlocking greater powers of mind as we go? Telepathy, telekinesis, the like? Hmm? Are the aliens coming back from the future? Are we hybrid beings at once human, time-bound, with limited abilities, but also secret supermen uh, and women, super people? Connected to the source of all existence and able to do the seeming impossible, like see the future before it happens, bend spoons without touching. The oh, yeah, that's in there, too. And so much more. The book's deep. Yeah, you should read it.